أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعليه الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله جرنا وجركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We have stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a distinction within the Quran absolute distinctions between right and wrong and that is maybe depicted by the verse لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ دِينَ You have your deen and I have my deen In addition we stated that actually religion gives us a very intimate sense of life and purpose where it connects the individual with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is the objective the individual is the entirety of the subject the entirety of purpose in the sense that the individual within the community or within the individual self begins to attain his self fully. Now that would be depicted in the Quran by Iman Billah and Iman Biyawmil Akhir. We stated that there is no centrality to prophethood in the way we have understood. The Prophet himself was a human. The Prophets, all of them were humans. The Imams were humans. They themselves in their humanness were attaining the objective which was the completion of their own self. There is centrality of the Prophet in depicting the absolute way in which self-realization can occur. But if we were to say there is centrality within the Prophet in terms of salvation, then in that case salvation will be restricted only to the people who uphold the prophethood of certain prophets. But we saw yesterday in the Quran that Allah offers salvation to the Jews and to the Christians and to the Sabians. And He does not distinguish in that between the Jews, Sabians, Christians and the Muslims. And if all of them were to follow those basic principles of God-directedness and realization of the self, then all of them will have salvation. In addition, it does not make sense at the level of human reason that salvation should be curtailed when two people are evolving, are becoming liberated equally. We stated the bottom line was liberation by giving the self away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And religious systems have shown a balanced life between here and hereafter that bring about this growth. Now, if we can retain all of that in our minds together with what we said about relativity, then we can now go further into this topic. The problem comes when people talk about Islam and finality of Islam. And what they understand by finality of Islam is centrality of the figure of the Prophet in terms of what he preached and in terms of what he practiced and in terms of what he acted out and what in terms of what he said. This is the point we are saying does not have centrality in the sense that we have understood. 
and Islam in the way that we have understood has no finality. We want to discover what is Islam in essence and hence we can then say that what we have understood of Islam is a human interpretation. What the Prophet and his divine progeny were giving of Islam was the actual real Islam. And therefore no centrality of any Prophet means no centrality in a stagnated sense in terms of our interpretation of what Islam is. If that is clear, then we can now embark upon the talk for today. Is that clear, by the way? There is no centrality in the way we have presumed the finality of the Prophet, and there cannot be. Human life is evolving, just as existence is evolving. This evolution needs to be fashioned and refashioned at different levels in its different points of strength as it goes from weakness into strength through the process of self-realization. Two, there can be no finality due to the law of relativity. Because there is relativity, you cannot apply one form of righteousness across the board. Three, the Quran itself is quite categorical in stating that salvation is across the board provided those fundamentals are being followed. Now, First and foremost, the word Islam in the Quran, in the way that we understand the formalized religion, is not being used, apart from a very few instances. And even then, it is used in a negative sense, as a formal faith. Where those tenen, tenets and principles were missing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no hesitation in saying that this Islam does not yield. Similarly, he states the same thing to the Jews and the Christians when those fundamentals of the individual arriving to God that we have depicted by belief in Allah and belief in the hereafter, when they have been missing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not hesitated in saying that this type of faith, whether it's Judaism, Christianity or Islam, is unproductive even though, even though, that horizontal relationship may be there. That horizontal, those horizontal principles may be the, the fundamentals. So here we have a case in which you have a Jew practicing Judaism perfectly, a Christian practicing Christianity perfectly, a Muslim practicing Islam to the utmost of their understanding in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet. But if it does not have the vertical principles and fundamentals of submitting, then Allah does not hesitate in saying that these are not godly people. And that their deen is the deen of the godlessness people, the people who are godless. We have this verse. Be careful when you read the Quran, that the word Islam, when it shows up, it's not in the meaning of a formal faith. It's in a very different meaning, which we want to bring out today or try and bring out with certain analysis. There's a verse in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Qalati al-Arab amanna. The Arab are saying, we have brought faith. Allah responds, Qul lam tu'minu. Say, you have not brought faith. Walakin kulu aslamna. Rather say, we have become Muslims. Rather say, we have become Muslims. Walamma yadkhul al-Iman fi qulubikum. And as yet, Iman has not entered within your heart. So here, Iman, is placed a category above Islam. And this Islam that the verse is talking about is the formalistic faith. And Iman here is talking about that Islam that we are trying to talk about, in which there is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beyond the self, the vertical principles, where there is liberation and there is growth. So in this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them that this Islam has no value at all within it because it has not yet yielded Iman. And how dare you say that we have brought faith. You have not brought faith. You have brought about formalistic Islam in which you will pray your Salah, you will fast, you will do this, you will do that. You will marry with the Muslim. You will live with the Muslim community. That's about it. Another verse where Islam is used in the sense of Islam. Yamunnuna alayka an aslamu. قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّ عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهِ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ 
they oblige you by becoming Muslims, tell them, don't oblige me through your Islam. Allah indeed obliges you that he has guided you. Here Islam is used in a formalistic sense. And as you can see from the tone of the verse, it has next to no meaning in terms of salvation. Now, when we look at the Quran carefully and we read the Quran carefully, we find two terms and these two terms accompany each other. The term deen and the term Islam. Islam is being used in two ways here. One, as we will see from the verse, for Allah is everything in a state of Islam, not everything, everyone. Now here Islam is in two meanings. One is submission to God, whether we like it or not, at a conscious level. And the other one is a willful submission to God at a conscious level. This is the usage of Islam within the Quran. Deen, on the other hand, as we will see from the verses very shortly, Deen, on the other hand, has come in the meaning of a means of submission, a way of submission. And Islam, therefore, is a willful, conscious submission to the deen, to the factors of submission. So whenever Islam is used within the Quran, it comes in the meaning, by and large, of an individual or a community making a decision to abide by those means of submission that are pleasing to God. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has suggested factors of growth. If I were to take a conscious decision to submit to those factors of growth, then in that case, by the Quranic language, I am termed as a Muslim. So deen and Islam fit in in this way. Islam is the individual's acceptance of the supremacy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then submission to those means of growth as dictated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or dictated by human experience or dictated by human nature. Now we said this four years ago and we need to repeat it today as we go into this theme properly. Before we go there, we will recite this verse. شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينَ مَا وَسَّى بِهِ نُوحًا وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ وَمَا وَسَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى أَنْ أَقِيمُ الدِّينَ وَلَا تَتَفَرَّقُوا Allah SWT is saying to the Muslim community, to the Prophet and his community, He has issued of the deen for you what He inspired Nuh with. And the same deen that He revealed Upon you is the same deen that he revealed upon Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa. That you uphold the deen and do not cause factions therein. So he's using the word deen in a universal sense. The same deen that you're, you, you, you're following, O Muhammad, is the same deen that we reveal to Nuh, to Ibrahim, to Musa, and to Isa. And these were the people with sharia's who came with a code of conduct. The Prophet is being told that it's the same deen. There is no difference in the deen that all of you have been practicing. And as our Mufassirin state, that deen has never been more than one. And Islam can never be more than one in the truest sense. And this is what we are after. But to explain this just for a little while, and we recall those lectures that we gave four years ago in the series of Human Islam. We stated that when Ibrahim, when, let's say when Adam came, he lived by a system. But when Nuh came, the human community had evolved. But whatever Adam lived by, Nuh would live by the same thing. Because Adam lived by principles, by morals. Those morals were productive, growth giving. He was submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Nuh comes, he brings a sharia. What is the meaning of sharia here? Does it mean that the factors of submission and growth that Adam was following, Nuh has totally abrogated them and brought in a new system? No, of course not. It's in an evolutionary trend. The community is evolving. 
what gave growth to Adam is the same thing that is giving growth to Nuh and his community. The only difference is that you have a far more sophisticated community. And hence, the fundamentals are still the same. God-human relation. Acting in accordance with the balance of here, hereafter. And that submits and that then yields growth and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what has happened? It's the same trend of evolution and growth that has been refashioned. But the same principles of growth are still there. It's just like a farmer planting a seed. The seed is treated in a particular way before it sprouts. But when it becomes a young plant, it is treated in a different way to allow the growth. When it devel develops a stem and a trunk, it is treated slightly differently. When it becomes fruit bearing, it's curled regularly to allow the branches to grow. What is the farmer doing at every level of the evolutionary growth of the seed? The farmer is allowing the seed to realize itself and just assisting it. Nothing else happens. It's the same thing that happens to a fetus. There is a natural progression within the womb. Once it comes out into this world, we treat the young baby very, very differently at different levels of its growth in order to aid its evolution, its self-realization and its growth. The same thing is happening within the human community. It is evolving and in the same way, Islam is addressing them. And when we say Islam, let's say Deen is addressing them in terms of wrapping and re-wrapping forming and reforming expressions accommodating those growth. Can we say salawat please? Oh. And come forward if you... Just slightly come forward, so... Islam or Deen is doing the same thing. It's the same evolutionary trend. Now when Ibrahim comes, Ibrahim comes and refashions whatever Nu has taught his community. What does he refashion? He refashions the secondaries, the other aspects of the core of growth. The core of growth is always entailed in these four principles. Human God, balance of here, hereafter. The only thing Ibrahim does is he refashions and reinterprets the relation of here, hereafter in order to accommodate further growth of a community that is far more evolved. And when Ibrahim comes, now you have challenges not only of God and the other, you have nation states. You have humanity interacting as nations, as religions. So of course the demand there is greater. That how do we strike balance now in this multi-relational human community that engages in such a complex manner. So Ibrahim now brings about a different expression. But it is always in sync with growth and human evolution. Similarly. When Musa comes, he does the same thing. When Isa comes, he does the same thing. In all of this evolutionary trend that we witness, there is only one thing that we are seeing, that there are fundamentals there, and these fundamentals are being reformulated. These fundamentals are acquiring different expressions all the time. They are, they are having one type of expression, at the level of Nu, another type of expression at the level of Ibrahim, then another type of expression at the level of Musa, then Isa, then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we see, we see that there are four principles that are always there. God, human, here, hereafter. In that, what is being changing is the here, hereafter one. The here, hereafter one changes all the time to accommodate the human-God relation and self-realization. 
Now here is the point. That if we were to say that Islam became complete in the way that we are understanding and we want to deal with that verse very shortly. That Islam became complete at the time of the Prophet. Then I will ask a question. Has the human community not evolved further? At the time of the Prophet, the paradigm was Muslim and non-Muslim. People who are enemies with Islam and people who are in truce with Islam. People who are friends with Islam in a Muslim state and people who are protected by Islam. Today that paradigm has changed altogether. You have nation states today. Has the human community not evolved? Two, at that point, the Muslims had the Muslim bloc in which the sun used to rise and set pretty much at set times. And in which the Muslims were the predominant force. Today, Islam is a, ho Islam is a guest in an alien host society. Has the paradigm changed or not? Has there been an evolution or not? Today, through technological advancement, we are able to leave our place and go into air and traverse at great speeds to another place. Has this technological advancement not challenged our sense of completion that was there? Today, the contracts in the world have changed totally. Speculations become contracts today. This is totally alien to the contract system that existed in the time of the Prophet. Today with medical advancement, we can keep people alive for years on end if we wanted to. Today, people can change their genders. Today, we can clone beings. Do all of these things not pose a challenge in which if we were to have this naive understanding, that Islam was completed in the way that we understand and the centrality of Islam, then I will ask that in the last 1400 years, after the demise of the beloved Prophet, has the world moved on or not by priority? The answer is that it's moved on far more than it had ever moved on before the Prophet. Would that not be something that we agree with? And then, if we look at the noble example of the Imams after the Prophet, we see a very different truth to the one that we have understood. For me and you, the problem has become that we have got intact the vertical principles, God, human. But we have made a mistake about the centrality of the horizontal principles. The centrality in the horizontal principle is the here, hereafter only. Whatever lies in the middle has no centrality. It is fluctuating in a state of flux due to the evolutionary nature of the human being, due to the relativistic nature of human societies and communities. Everything will move at a very different rate and at a very different state. We gave this example four years ago, and maybe it's a good example to give again as we go into this theme. That the Quran says, if these women are not obedient to you, then beat them. Yes? Now, I will not shy away and say that this means, like some of the feminists are saying, that it means turn away from them or go away in the land. I will say, no, it physically means beat them. It genuinely means beat them. And that is what, what, most, what most men do. They go and beat their women based upon the verse of the Quran. Now, if Mrs. Thatcher, I gave this example four years ago, were to be disobedient to her husband and not yield to him, do you think he should, he should go and whack her one and slap her and beat her up? Do you really think that that's what it means? And that, is, that has centrality in the way that we are understanding it? When the Quran says, the male and the female thief cut their hands off, do you really think that that has centrality in there? That was an expression of the equation of here and hereafter. The centrality was for the principle of God, human being, and in the broadest sense here, hereafter, everything in the middle is fashioned and refashioned. We will give ample examples in the lectures that are to come. As for Zul Rahman, he states, that in order for this verse of the jihad to be true, we need to create enemies forever in order to fight them so that the Quran is always true. Does that really make sense? Or, as he says again, in order, because Allah says, 
that do not take interest in usury because Allah is at war with those people who take usury. Does that mean that that is usury what we are doing today? Or does it have a greater sense in line with aiding evolution and growth of the community? This is exactly what we are trying to say. That Islam when used in the Quran has not been used as Islam that the Muslims understand a formalistic religion. Now look at this verse. And it's a lengthy verse and I've selected parts of it, yes? And a lot of parts of it are missing. But the centrality is there to Islam and the word deen. It's about Ibrahim and Ismail when they are building the Kaaba and these come in Surah Baqarah. And the verse after that, we need to read both of them and then look at the deliberations of our scholars. They say, Rabbana waj'alna muslimayn ilak. O Lord, make us two Muslims for you. Now here, when they are saying, make us two Muslims for you, they did not mean Muslim in the sense of me and you understanding Islam, do they? They did not mean, make us two Muslims, the ones who fast, who pray, who have this contract law, who have this system of rights and wrongs in marriage, who have this capital punishment system, who are these people who go and do Hajj, they did not mean Islam in that sense, because Islam was revealed 5,000 years after them, according to the way we understand. So when they are saying, make us two Muslims for you, here Islam is in a very different sense. Here is an indication of the greater Islam. وَمِن ذُرِّيَتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمًا And from our offsprings, make a nation that is Muslim or a group that are Muslims. And then Allah says in the following verse, وَمَنْ يَرْغَبْ عَنْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِيهَا نَفْسَ And he who turns away from the Millah of Ibrahim is one whose soul is fooled. We ask, what is the meaning of Millah Ibrahim? Faiz Kashani responds in his Tafsir Safi. He says, Millah Ibrahim is the Ibrahimic sentiment. Is the sentiment of Ibrahim, O Lord, make me a Muslim of yours. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ The next verse. قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لَرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ when his Lord said to him, Aslim, submit, become a Muslim. He said, I have become a Muslim for the Lord of the worlds. Again, the word Muslim is not in the sense that we've understood the formalistic Islam at all. Ibrahim Banihi Ya Muslimun. Ibrahim bequested this to his children, as did Yaqub. When Yaqub said, Oh my children, Allah has chosen for you a deen, a way of submission. Thus do not die except that you are Muslims. Except that you are Muslims. And then Allah says again, Am kuntum shuhada id hadara Yaqub al maut. Or did you witness when death came to Yaqub? It qala li bani ma ta'abuduna min ba'di. When he said to his children, What will you worship after me? We will worship your God, the God of Ibrahim, the God of Ismail, the God of Yaqub, the one God and for him we will be Muslims. From here you can see the word Muslim is used in a very different capacity to what me and you understand as a Muslim and Islam. It is used in just one meaning, in the meaning of willful submission to a growth-giving system which Allah calls deen. And deen, therefore, is whatever Allah has been commanding, willful submission to it is known as Islam and Muslim. Now, look at this verse. In the deen and Allah al-Islam. Indeed, the deen with Allah is Islam. Now this is the verse which most scholars will pick on and say that the only deen that gives salvation in the rightest sense is Islam. And hence Allah says in the deen and Allah al-Islam that the deen with Allah is only Islam. And this verse is being used as a means to bring about the exclusivity of Islam. That Islam is the exclusive stakeholder of righteousness. The Islam, but which Islam? The formalistic Islam that me and you understand of namaz and fast and zakat and khums in a way in which there is stagnation and nothing evolves, yes? But look at the way the verse stipulates, the verse further goes on. 
And the people who were given the book were in no difference about this truth that the deen is only Islam except when knowledge came to them in order to transgress against the truth. So this verse is actually saying that this deen which is Islam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the same deen and same Islam that the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians and the Majus had. And they distorted it willfully, deliberately, a sign of transgression. Immediately we begin to understand that in the deen, in the Allah, Islam does not mean what we are understanding from it. Now if we look at the instru- uh, deliberations of Tabat Tabai on this verse, he states, actually, him, uh, Marhum, Sabzwari, and other Mufassirin, they all state the same thing. That deen is only one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Submission to this deen is known as Islam in the greater sense. This deen is of gradation. It is of weakness and of strength. Completion and of deficiency in accordance with different eras and different regions. They are all admitting to this. That deen is only one. And submission to that deen constitutes the real state of Islam. What that means is that what the Jews were given of the deen and their submission to it was Islam. What the Christians were given and their submission to it was Islam. What the Muslims were given and their submission to it was Islam. What does that make Islam therefore? Islam becomes an evolutionary truth itself. What is deen? Deen has the fundamentals of growth that can be formed, fashioned, refashioned, reformulated, so long as they are in sync with human evolution and enjoy the central principle of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all it means. And the greater Islam, therefore, and the greater Islam, that we are talking about is that submission, not what we have understood. This is brings back, brings us back to our initial thing before we go into two more verses. That actually Islam is not what we have understood. If Islam was what we have understood, then immediately the Jews and the Christians are going to hell. But this is not the logic of the Quran. The logic of the Quran is the Jews and the Christians who are submitted will go to paradise. But their level of success may differ from each other in accordance with the deen system that they are following and the level and the sincerity of their submission. And of course, the community adds to the individual submission, growth and self-realization. Two, two, it will not allow for relativity. And we see within the Muslim sects nothing but relativity. You have 73 interpretation by that prophetic narration of Islam itself. And now within the Shia 12-er camp, you have a variety of interpretation as to what constitutes the essence of Islam. And how Islam should be in the modern times. You have two camps immediately opposing each other. The modernist camp and the traditional camp. And you have other variety of interpretations. If we were to say... Islam in the formalistic sense was only the Islam that the Prophet gave. Then even at that point, even at that point, we will see relativity permeating the cross-section of the Muslim mind and the way in which they were thinking. You get different theological schools immediately after the demise of the Prophet. You get different notions of leadership of in, within Islam. You get difference in how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it would mean that all of these are inaccurate and not correct at all. But if that was the case, then the Muslim community would not have flourished and gotten where it has gotten. What we are trying to say here is that when you look at the word Islam within the Quran, Islam merely means upholding those central principles which are vertical, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in line with whatever has been suggested in line with whatever has been suggested within the horizontal scheme. That's all it means. It does not mean that the horizontal scheme has finality. 
finality is within that balance that is brought about within the horizontal scheme, not in what is suggested by the horizontal scheme particularly. What does that mean physically? What it means, and we want to discuss this thoroughly, that when Islam talks about zakat and the stipulation of zakat, there is no finality to it. There is finality to giving to the community because community welfare constitutes the individual welfare and it brings about submission to Allah and growth towards Allah. When Islam suggests khums, it does not mean khums is to be given for the sake of giving or it is just one-fifth or it is in the way that the Quran has suggested. It means that there is a central message within khums and if it is not working, then it's not working. It needs to be re-envisaged. It needs to be reinterpreted. It is, a, it is the nature of a state to stipulate state taxes. When the Quran talks about its capital punishments, there is no finality in that word and in that interpretation. For the world enjoys no finality. It is there to accommodate the vertical principle. So long as it is balanced, we can then re-understand it in accordance with the differing contexts in which we are. Whether these are contexts in terms of the age and the era and evolutionary ones or horizontal in terms of the different locations in the world and the relativity that is brought about. This is squarely what it means. Now, if people object by further verse, then I want to deal with this verse very, very closely. I will recite a verse now and then we'll come to the verse that most, most causes the Muslim mind to stagnate. Look at this verse. It's in Ali Imran. Should I want other than the deen of Allah when everyone within the heavens and the earth, everyone, not everything, has submitted to Allah willfully or through coercion. Now, the word Islam is used in the context of everyone, not everything. And we stated Islam is a human condition. It relates to human state of submission. And then the verse goes on. قُلْ آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ وَإِسْحَاقُ وَيَعَقُوبُ وَالْأَسْبَاتُ وَمَا أُوْتِيَ مُوسَى وَعِيسَى وَالنَّبِيُّونَ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ لا نفرق بين أحد منهم ونحن له مسلمون. Say, we have brought faith with Allah, and whatever has been revealed upon us, and whatever has been revealed upon Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, Asbat, the tribes after Musa, and whatever Musa was given, the tribes after um, after ya uh, after Yusuf, and and Yaqub, and whatever was was given to Musa, and whatever was given to Isa, and whatever was given to the prophets. Through their, uh, uh, through their Lord. We do not distinguish between any of them and for them we are Muslim. And we are Muslim. We are submitted to all of this that has been revealed. Now look at this. Islam min. And he who desires other than Islam as a deen, it will never be accepted from him. Now this is the verse where people say, well, if there was no finality to Islam in the way that the Prophet gave. Then why would this verse say it? That he who desires other than Islam, then it will not be accepted from him. Look at what Islam is being explained as in this verse. Islam means submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught, this allows for relativity for those who are before the Prophet. For them, in the rightest sense, Islam was their Judaism and their Christianity. For the community of the Prophet, Islam in the rightest sense was whatever the Prophet was teaching them. For us, Islam in the rightest sense is whatever the Prophet has taught us in essence. If it is not working, then that is not submitting to something that is productive. So when we say, he who desires other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. It actually means that he who does not submit to the will of Allah, he will not be productive. The question comes, what is the will of Allah? This is where we find the biggest problem. What is the will of Allah? 
The Muslim community says the will of Allah is whatever the Prophet gave us and whatever we understood at the time of the Prophet and there is total stagnation. It has been closed off. The subject cannot be spoken of. What we are saying is that that is totally inconsistent with the way the Quran has been talking about Islam, with the way the Quran has been talking about deen. The Quran has been talking about Islam as submission to the means of growth that it determines as deen. And these means of growth have been fashioned and refashioned in accordance with their essential properties which are growth and liberation. How can we say that from the time of the Prophet till today there has been no evolution and there has been no growth? So we can say what is the will of God and what is deen? As soon as we find out what is deen, we are submitted to it and we are Muslims and we are Islam. This is exactly what we are trying to say. And for a people who are very naive in a closed reading of this verse, look at the verse and what it says. And he who desires other than Islam as a deen. In order to desire other than Islam as a deen, even in the formalistic sense, a person needs to have understood Islam properly in order to desire other than Islam. So that then excludes all the categories of people who have not understood Islam at all and then desire other than Islam. Immediately, it excludes all of them and none of them can be condemned. It immediately gives a sense of pluralism of truth. You can only desire other than Islam when you have understood Islam for what it's worth and then seek other. And then that person falls into the category of the enemy of God who is not submitted to God. As soon as you understand this is the will of God and desire other than it, then you're removed from salvation altogether. Whether you're a Christian, Jew, or a Muslim, or a Shia. Now, we come to this verse. اليوم يأيس الذين من دينكم يأيس الذين كفروا من دينكم فلا تخشوهم وخشوني اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم إسلام دينا. Now, Tabat Tabai has lengthy deliberation on this verse. He says, first and foremost, this part of the verse does not tie in with the rest of the verse. The beginning and the end of the verse talk about Subjects that are halal to consume and not halal to consume. It is said that those verses were revealed on the day of Arafah. Whereas this part of the verse that does not tie in with the beginning and the end was revealed on 18th of Dil Hijjah at Ghadir Khum. Now, if this part has been placed inside another verse that talks about consumables, then it immediately gives this meaning, Tabat Bai deliberates, that the deen has been completed due to the laws of Islam being given. And now the deen is complete. And this is the naive understanding of the Muslim community that the deen is complete, nothing remains of it. We near, merely have to follow it as has been given to us in a complete state. Tabat Bai brilliantly observes that if that is the case, then there were many ahkam and laws of Islam that were given after the revelation of this verse during the lifetime of the Prophet before he died. So what type of completion are you talking about? Can you see this? Are you understanding this? If people were to say the deen has been completed, if people were to say that deen has been completed and the meaning of completion is understood that Islam in a formal way has been completed, halal and haram, contract law, interactions of husband and wife, system of rights and wrong, capital punishment, and that is Islam. This is what the naive mind understands, that that is what it means. And now there is no scope of interpretation. There is no scope of us going anywhere else. There is an ideal model that is Islam, and that is what we have to abide by. If that was the case, then why were ahkam revealed after the revelation of this verse? And that means that the law system, moral system, social system, political system, capital punishment, none of this is completing Islam. The completion of Islam is something totally different. The completion of Islam is deliverance of those central principles that yield growth and aid the vertical relation in being realized. 
Because if you were to say that halal and haram were revealed and Islam was completed, then halal and haram subsequent to this verse should not have been revealed, but they were revealed. So what was the completion at this point? The completion at this point was nothing but the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that is what completed Islam. And the wilaya is designated as a point where the kuffar have become hopeless. Because a naive reading always suggests that the kuffar became hopeless because every tenet of Islamic law and morality was given. And now they know the deen is complete. No. In their minds, the kuffar was saying, we have not been able to uproot this faith so long as Muhammad has been around. As soon as he dies, we will uproot it. As soon as the wilaya was announced in Ali ibn Abi Talib, was designated as the wali, the kuffar said, no, we can't touch it anymore. We can't touch it anymore. It's a complete faith. And when Allah says, Al yom akmaltu lakum deenukum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum Islam deen, it's very relativistic. I have completed for you your deen. Akmaltu lakum deenukum, I've completed for you your deen. Wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati. And I've conferred all of my ni'mah upon you. And I have become pleased with Islam to be your deen. Here Islam is being used in a formalistic sense. But not Islam that was already defined. Islam as you have understood for yourselves, not the bigger Islam. Now, here is an observation. Taba Taba observes that ikmal and takmil or kamal and tamam. Kamula to complete means when its final part is provided. The final part here was not the hukam or not the law of Islam or morality of Islam. The final part was wilaya. And tamam means that it has the desired effects. So now if you were to submit in this system that has been suggested to you, it would be highly productive and you will begin to evolve. Now, if somebody now states that there is completion now through wilaya, and the principle of wilaya now completes Islam. Then I will ask a further question. I will ask a further question. What does it mean? The imam was there. Eleven imams after him were there. After the twelfth imam, where is wilaya? Where is that divine leadership that is taking the reins of temporal leadership? Where is it? It's not there. So that means Islam now is incomplete again. It was indicating at something far greater and much different to what we have understood. It was actually saying that this tenet of wilaya is the completion of deen in the sense that there is godliness and it is driven towards God. And that is what wilaya stands for in the broadest of sense. When we look at the mystics and the mystical deliberations around this. So we conclude again from this talk in point fashion. We stated the Quran uses the word Islam, but only occasionally has it used the word Islam in a formalistic sense in the terms of formal Islam. And even that Islam, Quran doesn't hesitate in criticizing. Just as it is criticizing Christianity and Judaism because the formal Islam, if it is at the expense of the vertical principle means nothing to God. What does it mean? The whole of the law system, the moral system, the social system, the political system, the system of rights means nothing. It's unproductive in the realest sense if there is no centrality to God and submission of human being. Just as it means nothing to be a Jew and a Christian at the exclusion of that vertical relation. Two, Islam is used in a much broader sense within the Quran. That sense of Islam merely means submission to Allah in terms of upholding whatever has been taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is termed as deen. That is the real Islam that is being suggested by the Quran. As far as deen is concerned, we have stated that deen comes in different 
colors. It has different expressions in accordance with human growth. At the time of Nuh, there was Deen. The same Deen in the time of Ibrahim is a bit different. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it is a bit different. It re it retains the central tenets of Deen. That is that balance of here hereafter, which allows growth. But the way in which these central tenets are expressed changes all the time. Finally, we stated that the verse that says, "Wamay yabtaghi ghair Islam dina falay." It will not be accepted from them. This verse means what? That he who accepts other than Islam, the main, main Islam, the real Islam, as a form of submission, it will not be accepted from them. And here we are saying, it can also mean the formal Islam. But formal Islam in line with the greater Islam. And then, when we recited the final verse, al yom akmaltu lakum dinukum, this completion of deen is not through its law system, as Ayatollah Tabatawa observes, nor through any of its teaching. It's only through one factor, and that is the factor of wilaya. And the wilaya factor, again, is a vertical factor, nothing to do with the horizontal scheme at all. If we have understood this, then we know that what we understand of Islam now, that we say is absolute, is a totally false claim. This is an expression of Islam that is the closest expression with the real Islam. But the real Islam has to always be in sync with deen. And the deen has a fluctuating nature in order to accommodate growth. So now, what we are saying is, if we can say Islam is submission to the deen, and deen is that which is in sync with growth and evolution, then we can open the door again to rethink into many of our cultures, into many of our sentiments, into many of our morality, into a lot of our thinking and bring it back in line with what the Prophet was doing. But, of course, we are not going to be naive enough and leave it there. We will explain from the lifetime of the Prophet, the Quran itself, and the Imams, how they understood deen and what the greater Islam was for them. So please, persevere and will, inshallah, hopefully, get there if Allah so wills and Allah so wishes. The one thing we are not saying is that namaz are not valid and fasts are not valid. We are saying all of this constitutes wilaya and deen and spirituality. All of them have to be up upheld, but they have to be understood in a very different light. And that is what we want to explain both at the social level and at the level of individual salvation. We come to the theme of our Knights of Muharram. Imam Hussein Salamullah Alayhi and his grand sacrifice. Imam Hussein we find on the day of Ashura, he is so much in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he does not lose sense of humanity. We can see people, when pressure falls upon them, that they lose their composure, they lose their sense of calm, and at times they lose a sense of dignified state of humanity and morality. But this is the great Hussein, the one who is enduring, but who is so submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that through this submission, his humanity comes to its utmost completion. He is witnessed and observed crying on the battlefield. They say to him, O oh Hussein, why do you cry? He states, I cry at the fate of my enemy. Why? Because of me, they will fall within the pits of hell. This is that richness of humanity within Hussein ibn Ali. We see him opening his arm and embracing Hur and saying to him, I have forgiven you, O brother, as my Lord has forgiven you. We see this great human 
and we see in that human this beautiful person that feels emotions but does not let his emotions rid him of that dignified noble state of humanity nor do they rid him of his wholesome submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never once do we find him and witness him on the day of Karbala Ashura him complaining to Allah oh Allah why has this fate befallen me never once this Hussein is saying Rabban bi qabaihi wa tasliman li amri I am pleased with his decree submitted am I in front of his command and then he calls out anta thiqati fi kulli hali wa la ma'bud siwaka you are the one I rely upon in every state there is no one worthy of worship other than you O oh my lord we see a highly spiritual individual evolving amidst tribulation we see a noble dignified human being displaying the full radiance of humanity amidst calamity at the same time he reserves his humanness he reserves the human pains and he feels them and he expresses his humanity in a most beautiful way Bibi Zainab sallallahu alayha had two of her children with her Aun and Muhammad now it is below Hussein ibn Ali to ask anyone to defend him it is beneath him it is beneath his dignity he would not do such a thing but it was the mothers of karbala that were spurring their children to the battlefield popular narrations tell us that zainab would summon own and muhammad and say to them time and again o oh children why are you still alive do you value yourselves beyond my brother? What face shall I show to my mother on the day of Qiyamah? They would say, Oh mother, do not be angry with us. He does not allow us to engage in the battle. When the majority of the army of Hussein had fallen and only his close companions, brothers and sons remained, Zainab invited them again within the tents. They said, Oh mother, he refuses to look at us. Now they had their own discretion. They were of that age where they could make a choice. Hussein sent Akbar to the battlefield. The sons of Imam Hassan went to the battlefield. The brothers of Abbas went to the battlefield. They died. Zainab was filled with anxiety. She said to Fizza, call my brother. When Fizza came to call him, he turned his face. He said, Fizza, do not talk with me. <laughs> Fizza comes back. We hear from narrations that Zainab says to Fizza, tell him, does he want me to plead with him myself? When Fizza stated this, he ran to the tents. When he ran to the tents, she placed her arms around his neck. And she said, brother, look at me. Look at me. What else do I have but these two children? They have willfully made the choice. Let them go. Tears roll down his eyes. What shall Abdullah say? By Allah, brother, he has given them for you. He has said, I can't come, Zainab. But if anything befalls your brother, please hasten and give them. Give him my children. Hussein lowers his head in acknowledgement. We see in Maqatil, she combs their heads. She dresses them and maybe tells them, O oh, Aun, O oh, Muhammad, if you were to see Amr ibn Sa'd, behead him and kill him. If you go to the Euphrates, remember Hussein is thirsty. Do not quench your thirst. The children are sent towards the battlefield. This is the scene that we find. That Hussein is standing upon a small hill, observing with Abbas the battle of the two children. Fizza stands 
at the door of the tent. And Zainab does not emerge, but sits on her prayer mat. When On and Muhammad appear, Ubaidullah, Umar ibn Sa'd asks, who are these two? They are the sons of Zainab. He said, baffled am I at the love of this sister for her brother, that she sends the apples of her eyes for death and destruction. They call on their equals in mutual combat, one on one. They kill quite a few people. There is a cry, waste not any more time. Surround them and kill them. When the children are surrounded, On is struck. When On is struck upon the head, he falls upon the ground. It is said that Muhammad went and lifted On's head. And he said, oh brother, I shall join you shortly. As he is talking with his brother, he is struck. When he is struck, he sends out a cry, oh uncle. When he sends out a cry, oh uncle. The Makatil Express, Hussein could not behold. He fell to the ground. As he fell to the ground, Fizza understood what had happened. And Fizza turns towards Zainab. Zainab, realizing, falls into prostration. <laughs> Hamid ibn Muslim says, Hussein rushed to the battlefield. The children's bodies were torn. He grabbed on in one arm and Muhammad in another. And as he came back to the tents, the scene was this, that their chests were in his arms and their legs were dragging against the dust of Karbala. Abbas Kummi remarks at this point, at all points, whenever Hussein brought back the bodies of the dead, Zainab would be the first one to receive them and cry over them. Hussein comes, with his eyes lowered, least he sees his sister. He comes next to the tents, raises his glances, but does not find Zainab anywhere. Why? Because Zainab does not want Hussein to feel a sense of embarrassment by looking at her. We are told, on the day of the 11th of Muharram, every woman falls at the body of their own martyr and shaheed, and cries upon it. Hamid ibn Muslim remarks, I went to the battlefield. I saw two young bodies unattended. I said, tell me, were these people without identity? Did they have no one with them? I was told, silence, O oh Hamid. These are the sons of Zainab. Where is Zainab, I asked. Go ahead and you shall find her with her brother. I found her in the embrace of a headless body crying. I said, Zainab, shall you not spare a tear for your children? He said, be away, away with you, O Muslim. I have given them for my Hussein. <laughs>